What's going on, engineers? So programming acronyms, terms, and other jargon is just constantly being thrown around, and sometimes you don't actually know what it means. So I wanted to create this video for about 20 of them to just explain exactly what some of this stuff means. So let's just get into it. I couldn't decide on order to put them in, so I just did them alphabetically. And for each term, I'm going to try to not use any additional jargon to explain jargon. I'm trying to make all the explanations very clear. So to start off, we have AJAX and XHR. And these two things are sometimes conflated to sort of mean the same thing, but they aren't. AJAX itself stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML, and it's really this general concept involving using this thing we call JavaScript and this thing we call XML and using it to asynchronously transfer data to a server. XHR, on the other hand, is XML HTTP request, specifically the XML HTTP request object that's contained in JavaScript. XHR can be thought of as an implementation of AJAX, but there's one little teeny tiny problem, and it's that it's not just XML as the name might imply. XML HTTP request can be used to send any data. Next up is API, which stands for Application Programming Interface. There's two common things for which API refers, and the first is web services, where you interact with somebody else's software through a web interface. This is things like REST APIs, like uh, Twitter API, Google API, Facebook API, that sort of thing. The second thing is when we're talking about like descriptions of module functionality. We're describing how a particular piece of software works. This would be something like the JavaScript API or the Python API. Next term is just backend, and you might hear people say something like that's on the backend, or that guy's a backend developer, things like that. In the web context, it refers to code that's on the server side. And for every other type of thing, it usually refers to the actual underlying code for a certain thing. So if you have a desktop application, you may refer to the underlying code as the back end of that desktop application. The next term is this broad thing we call the cloud. And this often refers to things like virtual machines and other services that are rented to the public for a price. You often hear things like cloud servers or cloud SQL, cloud storage, and things like that. One attribute of the cloud is typically these services are hosted from large data centers by large vendors, people like Google, Amazon, DigitalOcean, Linode, places like that. But it also hides this idea of hardware a lot, which is to say that you may get cloud storage, but you don't actually need to care or want to care about any of the underlying hardware. And you may not even know how it's implemented. You just know that you get to store files in this place and where they actually go, you don't really know. Next term is compiler, and a compiler, generally speaking, is going to be software that converts human-readable code to machine code. That's, of course, oversimplified. If we were to peel back a couple layers of the onion, we'd find that a compiler is actually a tool that takes human-readable code and turns it into assembly. It then assembles that assembly into object code, and then it links that object code into an executable. Next is cron. It gets its name from the Greek god Kronos. It's the most common method of running code at a scheduled time on a Linux server. You would basically say run this command like every hour or every day or on the third of the month. And then you have cron jobs, which are the commands. They're scheduled inside a cron tab, which is a list of commands. Next term is DevOps, which stands for Development Operations. Generally speaking, DevOps is going to refer to the teams of people that bridge the gap between development and IT concerns. Oftentimes, it's going to be a position held by either engineers with some IT experience and also IT professionals with some engineering experience. Next term is editor, and this is going to be a program used to edit code without integrations. And the without integrations part is important because we're going to talk about IDE later, which does have integrations. An example of this is going to be like Atom, VS Code, Vim, or Nano. An editor can almost be thought of as a stripped down IDE. Next term is encryption. This is going to refer to the process of converting data to scramble data using a key. The key is used to determine exactly how the data should scramble. And the good thing is because you know how it was scrambled, you also know how to unscramble it using the same key. Therefore, encryption is reversible as long as you have the key. Next term is front end, which is going to refer to a portion of a program that the user interacts with. And this is the converse of back end. The front end is going to refer to things like a web interface, a terminal interface, a desktop program, and so on. Next term is glue code, and generally speaking, this is going to refer to new code acting as an adapter to old code. I know I use a lot of glue code when I need to upgrade certain pieces of software, but I also need to interact with the legacy software. I'll write a tiny bit of glue code to seamlessly link the two. Next term is hash, and this is going to refer to the process of converting data to a fixed set of characters. A lot of times, hashes are mistaken with encryption, but hashing is only one way. Some common hashes you might have heard of are things like MD5, SHA, one, SHA2, and Bcrypt. 
One property of a hash is this thing we call the avalanche effect. And this is basically if you change a set of data by even one bit, it changes the hash entirely. Hashes cannot be reversed. However, they can be broken by pre-computed tables as well as brute force attacks. Next term is IDE, and this stands for Integrated Development Environment. IDEs are gonna contain everything an editor does, but also a lot of other smart features. One common integration for an IDE might be with a database. So imagine you are typing up queries in your project, but it's auto-completing the actual fields that are from your actual database. This is a way where you're getting smart autocomplete inside of your project directly from the database. Next term is JSON, and JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. JSON in general refers to the generic collection of data used for storing, transporting, and other purposes. And because it's JavaScript object notation, it's fully compatible with JavaScript without any modification. You can copy and paste JSON directly in JavaScript and it works perfectly every time. Next term we're looking at is low level and high level languages. Now this refers not to how good the language is, but how close to the hardware it is. So low level is gonna to refer to a language that is closer to the hardware, whereas high level is gonna to refer to a language that's more abstracted and hides much, if not all of the low level interaction. Now in 2020, it's probably the subject of some debate and some opinion as to what is high level and what is low level. If you're asking me for my opinion, low level to me refers to things like assembly and lower, and high level refers to everything else, such as C and higher. And the reason this is subject to so much debate is because back in the 70s when C came out, C looked a lot like a really, really high language if you put it next to something like x86 assembly. Now in 2020, C is still a high level language with respect to x86 assembly, but Python is a really, 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 really high level language put next to C. So then the question becomes, because Python exists, does that now make C a low level language? And here again, you're free to make your own opinion on that. Next term is regex or regex, which stands for regular expressions. This is gonna to refer to the actual pattern matching and text processing syntax that we use in various languages and also in various console commands. Next term is REPL or REPL, and this is going to be the read, eval, print, and loop. The way you would access a REPL interpreter, two common ways would be to just run Python with no arguments or Node with no arguments, and this will give you the Python and Node shell. From there, using the respective language, you can input a line of code, it'll process it, it'll return an optional result, and then it'll repeat and let you do it again. Next term is source control. This is gonna to refer to various software responsible for storing changes to files and facilitating simple collaboration with other developers. Some examples of source control are Git, Mercurial, Perforce, Team Foundation Server, and then less commonly, SVN and CVS. Those last two are pretty much all there was until Git and Mercurial showed up. Next term is transpiler. This is gonna be very similar to a compiler, except a transpiler turns human readable code into other human readable code. An example of a common transpiler would be like TypeScript, which transpiles to JavaScript. And then finally, we have VM, which stands for virtual machine. A virtual machine is gonna be typically Linux machines that are running sandbox within another Linux machine. Another common term associated with this would be a virtualized server. And we're done. Some of the terms and jargon is confusing, so hopefully I was able to clear some of that stuff up. If you have any additional terms or jargon that maybe I missed that you want to share with everybody, go ahead and place it in the comments below, as well as any questions or comments about anything you saw in this video. Other than that, I hope to see you on the next video. Take care.